reactions, some famous reactions. Here's a nice reaction, this top one here. Carboxylic acid, I think that's heptanoic acid, smells horrible. This is allyl alcohol. And this guy right here is the essence of banana, allyl heptanoate, very nice smelling compound. Let's say you wanna make this uh, material. Maybe you work for a company and your boss says, hey, we need three kilos of allyl heptanoate next week. We have some customers. Well, you look it up. Well, we're going to make it from the acid and the uh, alcohol here. And you look at that and you think, well, yeah, there's some bonds we're going to break and some bonds we're going to make there. And that should be favorable. And you think about the conditions there and what are you going to do? But if you just put those two things together, guess what? No reaction. Oh, you don't get this pleasant smell. And by the way, that's how you can tell if this reaction's working or not. <laughs> Start to smell bananas. Um, so what do you do here? Well, you notice you need a catalyst and it's sulfuric acid. And once you add the sulfuric acid, you'll create a kinetic pathway that's lower, that'll be faster to get to the product. But then you look up the bond association energies here for what you're making here, and it's not really favorable. It's not exothermic at all. So how can you make it more favorable? Well, there's some things you can do. You can heat it up here, okay? And that will make things go faster and create more of your product maybe at equilibrium. But the other key thing about heating it up here is you can distill this. And this distillation allows you to remove the more volatile, the lower boiling point ester. And even though it may not be favorable, at least you got your catalyst in there that's starting to make the ester. You can smell it already. And yeah, you heat it up and you have a condenser on a sidearm and you start to bring over this ester. And even though it's not favorable, you look up these bond energies, but yeah, you're heating it up and you're uh, adding the catalyst to get this thing to go. And plus you notice that the allyl alcohol is very cheap. So you add that in excess. And yeah, that makes it go faster too. It consumes more of your acid more quickly and it makes a better yield for your ester. But yeah, there's some a lot of things going on here. Okay, what bonds are we breaking or making here? We're actually breaking this uh, this oxygen acyl bond here. We're bringing that in there. Notice the elements of water. Yeah, byproduct is water. And that's another way to make this reaction go faster. You can actually sequester the alcohol or add a drying agent that will take that uh, water byproduct out of the equilibrium and give it there. But yeah, it is an equilibrium, but there are certain factors here that we can do to favor this reaction anyway. But the more we know about a reaction going into it, gives us more control in a practical sense. And yeah, if your boss is breathing down your neck to make three kilos by next week, you know, you gotta <laughs> do everything you can to make sure you can get enough of that material there. But let's back up and go through these things sequentially. What are we talking about? Bond association energies. So this is a general idea. There's a big table in your book. If you've been reading ahead, we'll look at that table here in a second. But Here's your generic bond between two atoms. Remember, a line means two electrons. So we're breaking this bond in this manner. And what type of bond breaking is that? We looked at two different types of bond breaking last time. What were they? Homolytic and heterolytic. Which one is this? This is homolytic because we're giving the same type of products, these radical products. We use uh, homolytic bond association energies to compare different reactions because they're convenient. They're very easy to prepare. Uh, they're neutral products here. They're a true measure of this bond strength here. If we compared bonds always heterolytically, we'd have a cation and anion. We'd have solvation uh, issues that would obscure the true energies there. So. Uh, and there are often other factors with ionic things, but um, heterolytic gives other things, but the homolytic thing gives these neutral things. And as it's drawn here, what would we say? Is this exothermic or endothermic? Okay, that's another thing to look at the diagrams. What do we think? So, you know, two odd electron species here. Would they rather be closed shell with the octet? or would they rather be open like this? So this is gonna require energy. This is gonna be endothermic as we've drawn it here. So this would be uphill. If we go the other way here, that would be exothermic, okay? 
So this measure here of the energy, and here's a here's a simple one. And this has been measured. This is very accurately known. Hydrogen molecule breaking that bond between the two, go to two hydrogen atoms costs 104 kcals per mole, and that's quite a bit. Okay. Generally, the smaller the atom, the stronger that bond. And you can see here, comparing it to the chlorine molecule, also just a single bond between the two chlorides, to go to two chlorine radicals here, that uh, costs a lot less energy, uh, 58 kcals per mole. Let's look at the table here and try to point out some trends here, if we can go up there again. And, and uh, you know, don't memorize this table. Know the trends, though, in what's operating here. And what you see right away, we're talking about enthalpies, right? Delta H. That's the energy in bonds. And, oh, kilojoules per mole. Ouch. <laughs> that's what uh, physical chemists and people who worry about uh, actual units, scientific units, use physicists and physical chemists. Organic chemists, we prefer kcals per mole because that relates to other things, you know, Raising the uh, temperature of water. A kcal, what, what is the energy to raise one gram of water one degree Celsius? Okay, so that relates to something we're a little more familiar with there. Um, kilojoules is about 4.1 times bigger than kcals. You'll always see kcals on my quizzes or tests. And any calculations, and we'll get to this, we'll show you how we expect you to use these numbers, but... Uh, yeah, as so you go down the periodic table here, here's the hydrogen halides. Uh, those are weaker bonds if they're bigger, like I mentioned there. Uh, smaller bonds, yeah, uh, are generally higher in energy. The halogen molecules themselves are very unstable. <laughs> in fact, fluorine is an explosive material, very weak bond. And there's our peroxygen bond. I mentioned that, an oxygen-oxygen bond. That's pretty weak, too. The lone pair repulsions there weaken that bond a lot, 51 kcals. Here's the important ones, the organic uh, bonds here. And here we have a hydrogen on a methyl group, methane 104, similar to hydrogen, molecular hydrogen. But if it's on an ethyl or a propyl, or look, you get to an isopropyl, it goes down 95 compared to 98 or so. Why is it going down there for, for isopropyl? And then terbutyl, look at that, 91. And then uh, we got the hybridization effects here. If it's sp2 hybridized, it's held a little bit tighter and it's higher in energy, harder to break that bond. Now, why is that? You can think about hybridization, right? What's the nature of that bond to carbon? If it's sp2 hybridized, there's more what? More S character. Those electrons are held closer. S is the spherical atomic orbital. So it has more S character that's held closer to the carbon, and that bond strength goes up. And you see that dramatically on acetylene, SP hybridization, yeah, 125. But then it drops way down if you go to allylic, okay? And then on the side of a benzene, it goes way up. That's SP2 hybridization. But then benzylic, if it's on a carbon sp3 hybridized next door to a benzene, that's what the C6H5 is, right? Benzene, condensed formula. I'll go to the board and draw some of those in a minute. But that goes back down there. So those are trends we need to know. Similar things with carbon-carbon bonds, hybridization there. And also carbon-halogen bonds. You can look at a couple here. Let's just go through the chlorine series. So methyl chloride, yeah, 84. Ethyl chloride, 81. Isopropyl chloride, 80. Keeps dropping down, okay? The more substituted it is. And where's terbutyl? They got terbutyl? Yeah, 79, <laughs> okay? So let's go to the board and try to figure out some of these. Uh, what do we got? We got more substitution, which is going to make those bonds weaker, and hybridization is going to make them stronger. So let's look at a couple things here. Not not a lot, but, uh, you know, if we break this bond, we're going to go to the ethyl. Uh, but if we break this bond, which is weaker, we're going to go to the isopropyl. So this is a primary radical, we'd say, and this is a secondary radical. Now that's going to have important consequences, right? This one's a few kcals per mole. 
uh, lower in energy, weaker bond, the more substituted. Same thing with tert butyl, even more substituted, right? What do we call that one? Not primary second, but tertiary. Yeah. So something about having more carbons around here that will stabilize these type of intermediates. And that's even more dramatic if these are cations, if we look at the ionic version. But this is borne out in bond association energy substitution makes those uh, weaker if they're more substituted like that. Oh, what was the other one? Let's compare ethyl with uh, acetylene and, uh, yeah, ethylene and acetylene. So this hybridization SP2, did we say? Yeah, that's held closer. Uh, and this one here, uh, SP, okay? So those electrons to begin with being held closer makes this harder to break. This is a more stable bond. Now you should be careful on this one, and there's a discussion about comparing acetylene radical to the acetylene anion. Now, when we do it ionically and form this conjugate base, you can actually deprotonate the terminal acetylene. The pKa here is 25, okay? And taking that off with a strong base is a different process than bond dissociation energy. This is a more stable bond, being sp2 hybridized, if you look at the starting material and breaking it homolytically. But if you break it heterolytically with a strong base, this is a different thing than that, okay? So on that homework problem, you need to uh, point that out. One other thing to point out here is, uh, oh, benzene versus benzol. Okay, uh, this one was stronger, right? Because it's sp2 hybridized. But this at the benzylic position, you see, uh, this one is weaker, a lot weaker. It drops down to like 80, right? K calls for mole to break it in the benzylic position. Well, why? Well, now we have what? Resonance. <laughs> you don't have resonance here with these pi bonds, okay? These pi bonds in the benzene are perpendicular to the sp2 orbital right on the edge. But if it's benzylic, okay, BN, benzylic position, we have a carbon next door to a benzene here. This is actually called a phenyl position, okay? And those are kind of funny terms. So I've, I've used that term phenyl, and we've shown phenyl before. That's the prefix name for a benzene substitute on there. Sorry, benzol is where you have a carbon next door to a benzene. Those are kind of uh, confusing terms there, but very different. It, this one's weaker. It's more stable due to the resonance effect than this one. Oh, the other one was allyl, right? If we break this one, uh, if we have a carbon here next door to that, this one was harder to break, right? Because it was sp2 hybridized. But if it's allylic, just like benzylic, what do we have? We have this resonance idea. And let's draw the resonance structure for an allyl radical. Oh, there it is. <laughs> so a lot we learn, and we'll see this moving forward, the structure of these intermediates can either be stabilizing or destabilizing, okay? And that can affect the rates and the equilibrium of what's going on. But that's a few to kind of round out the uh, chart there. All right, let's use these uh, to actually estimate reactions, okay? And numerically, there's a little bit here. Not a lot of math, but don't worry. The delta H for a reaction is equal to the energy that we're bond breaking uh, plus the energy that we're bond making, okay? So if we're making bonds here, bond making, that's generally a uh, exothermic process. That'll be stabilizing, but if bond breaking here, that's gonna require energy, okay? And these are good representations of reactions. The true thing for reactions is right, delta G, free energy, which is the energy of the whole system there, minus T times delta S for a reaction, entropy. But normally, delta S is the same on both sides because we're in solution, condensed phase, and as long as things aren't becoming more random, whatever, or gas is being liberated, whatever, as long as that's not happening, uh, delta G then, <laughs> is approximately equal to delta H, okay? <laughs> Technically, you should use the term exergonic or endergonic, <laughs> and those sound really funny if you're talking about delta G for a reaction. 
exothermic, we're talking about the energy in bonds. But essentially, that's the same in OCHEM. Uh, you'll hear me use the term, don't correct me. Oh, technically, that should be exergonic, Dr. Anderson. Okay. <laughs> We're, we're, we're looking at delta H, which is in these bond association energies. We can use these to estimate things on reactions. So let's do some here. How about this reaction? Ethylene plus HBr going to ethyl bromide. And I think we showed you this type of reaction last time. <laughs> But what can we do here? Let's add up the bonds that we're breaking and the bonds that we're making here. Now, this this one right here, ah, we need to talk about this bond association energy. <clears throat> this is in your appendix here. If you do this and just break the pi bond there, that's about 60 kcals, okay? So uh, a sigma bond is worth about 100. So if you keep going here and go to the two carbons, I guess they'd be carbenes at that point. <laughs> okay, whatever else is on here, uh, you'd have this. And that would be another 100 kcals. A lot of times with alkene reactions, we're just breaking the pi bond, okay? And I think I told you that before, the stability of a pi bond is a lot lower than the stability of a sigma bond. And that's what we're doing here. We're breaking this pi bond. So this is going to cost us what? Let's add up the bond association energies and see here. So we've got about 60 kcals per mole there. What about hydrogen bromide? It's up there on the chart. Hydrogen bromide, where is it there? 88. Yep. Okay. So plus 88. So this is the bonds we're, what, breaking? Breaking the pi bond here, breaking this bond here. And what are we making here? Oh, I didn't draw that. <laughs> Carbon-hydrogen bond, that's worth about uh, 98. And that's downhill. So what, that's the exothermic part. Those are the bonds we're making, right? So we're getting that energy back out. And then we're making a carbon-bromine bond. What's that? Minus 68. So that's up there on the chart also. So what's the delta H for the reaction here? Well, it's one, uh, one uh, 48 minus what? 166. So the total for this reaction is what? Minus 18. So what does that mean? Is the reaction exothermic or endothermic? Exothermic, and that's liberating quite a bit of energy. In fact, that will go like a shot. You don't need a catalyst. <laughs> this acid, when it gets in the presence of an alkene, it'll go quite quickly. We'll see the mechanism later. But just looking at the bond association energies and estimating this, this is pretty close to experimental observation. I don't have the actual number for the thing, but, uh, but yeah, that's pretty good. All right, let's do a couple more here. You get a feel for that, though, where you find the numbers and where they're at there. The only one missing on your table in your chapter is the pi bond energy. That's in the appendix at the back of your book. But you can find that. Okay, how about this one? Terbutyl alcohol plus HBr going to terbutyl bromide and water. Now we've got to make sure we use the right energies here. What bond are we breaking? We're breaking a terbutyl, a tertiary oxygen bond, and that costs 96 kcals. And HBr, that's the same thing, right? 88. And then what are we making here? We're making a terbutyl bromide. I think that's on the chart too up there, isn't it? What is it? I think you can see it. Are those numbers too small? <laughs> It's kind of hard to see those condensed formulas. Oh, there it is toward the bottom, right? 65, is that right? And that's going to be what we're making. So 65. So we're already saying, wait a minute, look at this. This is pretty high, right? These are about 100 each. And then all of a sudden, we're only getting out 65 kcal. You might think, oh, this reaction's doomed. It's not going to work at all, is it? How's this going to work? Oh, the saving grace is right here. What's the hydrogen-oxygen bond worth? Look at that, minus 119. Okay, those small ones. 
an electronegative atom like oxygen, a uh, hydrogen oxygen bond, yeah, <laughs> about 120. And that you're getting out. And add up these numbers, what's the reaction? Can you add up those numbers real quick? What does it come out to be? <laughs> Zero. <laughs> so we're right at equilibrium here, you'd say, right? So this reaction would look like this where those two energy points are at the same spot, truly at equilibrium on their ideal conditions, then what would it be? 50-50 on each side. Can we still do a reaction like this, though? Can we make this reaction favorable? Yeah, there's some things we can do. If we sequester the water or dehydrate it, by Le Chatelier's principle, we're going to bring over more of this product, right? Or we could use excess of this. If we use more of this, Again, we're changing uh, the system. We're applying a shock to the system. And Le Chatelier, the famous French chemist, said if you apply a shock to a system at equilibrium, it will react in such a way or adjust to maintain that equilibrium constant, K, right? So here's some adjustments here, and we can still get this product, even though what? This is not exothermic. <laughs> That's right there. Anyway, okay. How about uh, this one? Go to ethyl chloride plus water. Similar thing here. Uh, we can come up with these numbers, okay. This is at a primary position now. 94. Uh, HCl is what, 103. Carbon chlorine primary bond minus 81. And then, yeah, 119 again. And there's our saving grace, I think. <laughs> what's this? If you add those numbers up, what's the, for this reaction here? I think it's minus 3. Yeah. So that would be favorable, at least just looking at the bond association energies. Um, here's one. Let's do another one here. <laughs> And this is similar to a reaction I kind of showed you as a famous uh, reaction that we're kind of trying to get to go. Let's take an alkane and go to the alcohol. And our byproduct here would be hydrogen gas. We'd like to be able to do this reaction. Why is this a tough reaction to do? Well, there's no functional group on the alkane, right? It's just ethane. <laughs> You're going to see this might be a problem. Plus, we're what? We're breaking this hydrogen-oxygen bond, and that's worth quite a bit. Let's add these up. Plus 98 for that. Plus 119 here. Carbon-oxygen, yeah. Minus 94 and minus 104. What's this reaction? Plus what? <laughs> it's highly, what, endothermic have to add a lot of energy to get that to go, okay? So the starting material's more stable than the products, okay? Not getting enough out of that one. All right, let's compare these to uh, some other reactions we've talked about. <laughs> so you get a feel for this. Uh, C8H18 um, plus oxygen going to CO2 plus water. Oh, and this points out another thing. If you use these energy values to do this, you've got to have a balanced equation. What do we have here? Eight, nine. Okay. How much energy is this? You can actually add up all these bond association numbers and times them by these uh, prefixes, right? And what do you get here for octane, burning? How much heat is this? Well, this is a tremendous amount of energy. Over a thousand kcals. <laughs> okay. okay, and that's why octane is such an important fuel. Uh, pound for pound, density wise, energy density wise, it still can't be beat. So, you know, we're stuck with hydrocarbon fuels for quite a while. All sorts of ideas for alternative energy sources, but the cheapest one, and, and hydrocarbons, petroleum is still abundant. So, yeah, you can see the energy-wise compared to these other simple reactions, right, which are kind of a, at a balance, right, barely exothermic, barely endothermic. What about this one, glucose plus oxygen? I won't balance this one. 
Same thing, CO2 and water. It's going on inside your body, though. This is glycolysis or metabolism. How much energy here? Oh, minus 686 kcals. Wow. <laughs> That's a tremendous amount of energy, too, right? So blood sugar or glucose has been chosen by nature to supply that energy to every living cell. This is how things work. It makes ATP so your muscles can move, whatever. So that reaction is similar there. We know those numbers also. All right, what about the thermodynamics here for a reaction? We've been talking about this already. We've already been looking at diagrams. Thermodynamics here. So any reaction, A plus B going to C plus D, we can write an equation for it. Equilibrium expressions, concentration of the products. And what do the brackets mean again? The brackets mean molarity or moles per liter. So you can measure these things, okay? So these are known for a lot of reactions over the concentrations of the starting materials. And the directionality of how it's drawn there, left to right, is important for how you set up this equation, okay? So what does this mean in practical sense? K here, equilibrium, if it's greater than one, what does that mean? <laughs> it means what's going to be favored? If K here is greater than one, are products favored or are starting materials favored? Yeah, it's a numerator denominator thing, so products are favored, okay? So we're going to products here. If K is less than one, what we're going to uh, starting materials, okay? And there's some other equations here, right? Uh, delta G, as we've already been looking at it, is the delta G for the products uh, minus the delta G for the starting materials. Okay, That's what we've been doing with the enthalpy, the bond association numbers. And approximately, if entropy isn't involved, which it usually isn't if we're comparing reactions in solution, we don't need to worry about. The other delta G reaction here is what? Delta G equals minus... RT natural log K. For this K, you see, can be a ratio of products here. Okay? And that K can change depending on the temperature. But the delta G for a reaction is fundamental for the enthalpy and entropy of a reaction. That doesn't change depending on the temperature. The temperature, if that changes, can change the K. And that was that first reaction we talked about, forming the banana ester, why did we heat that up? That created more of that minor product. Even though that reaction may not have been favored, at higher temperatures, we would have had a more favorable ratio of the things. So there's some things we can look at that and we can uh, change to uh, think about that. We've already looked at this from a conformational point of view. And this is important to remind us of this. We've got this equilibrium for benzene, a phenyl group, on cyclohexane. So this is phenyl cyclohexane. Is it in this conformation or is it in this conformation? And what is this energy difference? Which one's favored, the left or the right? Okay, the right. Why? Because the benzene's in what? An equatorial position. This is an axial position. And we can look at the gauche interactions right here, right? And these axial hydrogens would actually be bumping into this benzene here in the axial position. Uh, this delta G here is favored for us. It's drawn here to the right. It's minus uh, 2.9 kcals. And what does that mean ratio-wise? Well, it depends on the temperature, but that's almost 3 kcals. <laughs> So it's almost all this, okay? Yeah, there's some of that over there, but, you know, confirmation, we've looked at that before. And, yeah, maybe we'll just go back to the, oh, there's something more I want to say about kinetics now. We'll look at this. We'll see, a, we'll see the chart again in a second. That's just to jog your memory and relate that to free energy. Uh, so I'd call that, you know, a reversible process, uh, but favored to the right there. Kinetics now. So speed of a reaction. And your book talks about the energy of activation. 
that's an Arrhenius expression. He was a famous uh, Swedish chemist about 100 years ago. And he talked about this energy of activation. He can measure it for some reactions. This has to do with how fast reactions go. The modern equivalent of this is um, transition state theory based upon delta G of activation. Anybody know who developed that theory? Not Arrhenius. He's the father of a famous leader of our church. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, El, uh, President Eyring's father, Henry B. Eyring, was a famous physical chemist at Princeton. Uh, he did his training in Europe with Poliani. And most people think that transition state theory, relating it to the uh, free energy of activation, which is different than the Arrhenius function, should have uh, garnered a Nobel Prize. We just had the Nobel Prize awarded for the people who developed CRISPR-Cas9, which is the gene editing process. <laughs> just had the chemistry Nobel Prize awarded. A person at Berkeley, uh, Dudna, Professor Dudna, and a professor at the Max Planck Institute in Germany, I think. Both ladies, which is, which is kind of unique for Nobel Prizes too, <laughs> which is great. But yeah, poor Henry, uh, he developed this theory and we still use the Eyring equation. It's named after him. <laughs> And if we want to fully explain kinetics, we have to do a lot of calculations and a lot of close experimental work. And that relates to the free energy of activation, both the bonds that they're being made and broken at the transition state and how random or, or disoriented that transition state is. We're not going to use that. We'll just talk about it qualitatively there. Okay. But uh, yeah, energy of activation. Uh, if it's large, uh, that means it'll be a slow reaction. If it's uh, a small, barrier, that means it'll be fast. Okay, we've already talked about that a little bit. But why? What What are the factors that really go on here? Well, it's the speed with which they collide. So if we raise the temperature, <laughs> we're going to raise uh, how fast they're moving. That's Graham's law. Smaller molecules and temperature, they respond, right? They're excited. They're banging into each other, whatever, either in the gas phase or in solution. Okay, so temperature uh, affects the speed there. And the important thing here is uh, geometry. For organic molecules, we're talking about lining up what? The HOMO going into the LUMO. And that's a geometry thing. There's a lot of collisions that aren't productive. But boy, if that nucleophile hits exactly in that sigma star for an SN2, that'll make that reaction go faster. Okay, but it has to be lined up. And that's why catalysts and enzymes work so well. They pre-organize the reacting things and promote the correct geometry for a productive collision. So they can often speed up reaction even at lower temperatures, which is an amazing thing. But those are some of the factors in general. If you raise the temperature by uh, 10 degrees C, you'll double uh, the rate. Okay, and we've talked about rates before. The rate is proportional to a rate constant, which can be measured, uh, the starting material. And if it's just on its own like that, we call that a unimolecular reaction. And unimolecular uh, means that uh, the slow step is just breaking that bond. And it might be homolytic or heterolytic, but it's just one bond being broken. Okay. The rate can also be proportional to the starting material and a nucleophile. And I mentioned that last time also, right? We call that bimolecular. And that would be something like this, where you have A, B, and that bond being broken. But C here, a nucleophile is attacking and going to the product. So here it's colliding, involving two molecules, depends on the concentration of both of those, okay, and we call it bimolecular. So these kinetic rate law expressions often tell us a lot about the mechanism, uh, but I like to, to relate that back to that. Yeah, I think we've seen most of that. And catalysis, yeah, we'll revisit catalysis here right at the end. So let's go back to the overheads here. Let's see what else we know. Again, all this is general too, so don't sweat any of these details yet until we get to the actual stuff here in chapter seven and eight. But the basics here hopefully is resonating with you a little bit from your gen chem idea and what we've talked about there. And we'll keep it qualitative, you know. Yeah, 
So here's the thing from your book. Oh, here we're using the log 10 value for the delta G expression. I don't know. I like the natural log one because then you get rid of this. <laughs> you have to have the right gas constant here, which relates temperature to energy uh, there. But yeah, so delta G, those values are specific for a reaction. That's a fundamental thing involving the energy in those bonds, okay, and how random things become. Uh, the temperature, though, relates that equilibrium expression uh, back and forth there. Yeah, and it does have to be in Kelvin. I've never put an actual, you know, uh, equilibrium expression calculation on a quiz or a test, but know what the fundamentals of these numbers mean and how it's how they relate there. Here's what, you know, from a practical sense, what this means. So if we're at equilibrium, here's the difference in energies. And if it's positive there, right, it's going to be all starting material, or A. Oh, and it's in kilojoules. Sorry. So you got to divide these by four to get any meaningful numbers there. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, the kcals are always smaller, which is nice. My advisor in grad school used to say, we were doing stereoselective reactions. So we were trying to get high selectivities. And he always used to say, give me one kilocalorie per mole at minus 78 degrees and I can rule the world. <laughs> that has to do with Archimedes' famous statement. Give me a firm place to stand and a lever and I can move the world, right? Okay, <laughs> so even though these are small energy differences, look, you can get 10 times as much. Well, let's go over to the product side. So here we are, exothermic. And yeah, if we're just uh, one and a half kcals per mole, divide by four there. For just one and a half kcals per mole here favoring B, that's 10 times as much toward B, okay? And this is at room temperature. I'll show you the numbers here at air temperature. Yeah, if you go up to, to two or three kcals per mole, it's essentially all B, okay, at 25. Uh, here's the Boltzmann distribution. This is for conformational energy differences which are equilibrium values, right? These are close in energy, just rotating around single bond. But you can relate the same uh, values here, this, these same curves apply to reactions in equilibrium in general. So here we are at room temperature, 21C. And what did we say? Uh, if you got one kcal, give me that one kcal, you see, <laughs> you're already at 8515. <laughs> but look, if you're at minus 78, if you cool your reaction out, you're up at 95.5. You're highly selective. <laughs> okay, so that's the joke of organic chemists. All we need is one kcal, and we can rule the world, right? We can make selectivity happen. Um, let's see. The other thing to notice here, if you're at higher temperature, if you have one kcal per mole difference, that's only 70-30 then. And what's up with temperature there? There you have enough energy to populate the higher energy conformer or the higher energy side, Okay. So that was that first example. We talked about the banana ester. Even though that's not favored, if we heat it up, at equilibrium will start to favor more of that unfavored ester product, okay? And if we can distill it off, we can still make it, okay? So that's the uh, the ruling thing there. And these diagrams, I drew a bunch of these last time. This would be a, a bimolecular type reaction if C minus here was attacking and breaking that bond. A yeah, bimolecular reaction, there'd just be one transition state. And this is what, exothermic or endothermic, as we've drawn it here. It's another thing to notice. Given the diagram, can you tell whether it's giving off heat or requiring heat? Exothermic. Why do you say exothermic? Right. So these diagrams are descriptive that way. And that change in energy right there, bond association, this is right there. That's the only position we look at. Here's energy of activation of the transition state, the dagger thing uh, that Iring came up with would be right here. Again, anything that destabilizes that transition state or makes it higher will make that reaction slower. Anything that stabilizes the transition state will make it faster. But the energy, the heat overall is the same, okay? This height barrier difference here doesn't have anything to do with the heat of the reaction. <laughs> I should qualify that, okay? Uh, if you do lower this down, uh, it can affect, well, no, I won't, I won't get into that. <laughs> they are linked sometime, okay? But generally when we talk about the heat of the reaction, it's just the energy of the starting materials to products, okay? 
the barrier here is that, that difference. And then we can depict it different ways. So here would be a, a slow reaction compared to this one here. These are both endothermic, comparing examples one to three. Why do you say endothermic? Because the energy here of the products is higher. And why is this a faster reaction here on the right? Because this barrier is lower, okay? You can see the same here for a couple of what exothermic reactions. Is this the fast one or the slow one here on the left? Slow, yeah, okay. <laughs> you got the idea there. So that's the difference we've been talking about. Yeah, these nice diagrams in your book. Okay, the molecularity of the reaction, whether it's bimolecular or unimolecular, this comes out of the rate equation like we talked about. If we have just one bond breaking, that's generally the slow step, and that would be a unimolecular process. And then maybe a faster step is just grabbing this cation with a new reagent, nucleophile, whatever, to form the product. Now, if it happens this way, this is a stepwise reaction, and the slow step here is unimolecular. That would be uh, this equation right here. Rate would just equal K times the starting material, okay? It would be independent, actually, of the concentration of C if this is part of the fast step, okay? And we'll point that out later when we get to some specific reactions. So we can identify which is the fast or the slow step. But here is a more complex energy diagram for a two-step reaction. And we'll see these for SN1 type reactions coming up. So here's the slow step, just decomposing A and B to make that carbocation B. And notice that is highly endothermic. And this barrier right here, this first one is the highest barrier, okay? So we call that the rate limiting step in this case. It's the slow step. It's independent of C. C is this step. C minus taking the carbocation here. Here's that bond we're making in this transition state. But notice that energy of activation is tiny compared to this first one here. Okay. So the kinetics of a multi-step reaction, when you look at each step individually, this is the slow one. This is the fast one. It goes down to product. Is this an exothermic and endothermic reaction overall? Yeah, it is exothermic. There it is. That's that energy still right there. But it's that uh, barrier right there, getting things to go. Okay, how do catalysts work? Yeah, anybody lactose intolerant out there or would like to admit it? Oh, there's always a couple people. Okay, if you're of Northern European extraction, uh, heredity-wise, you're probably not lactose intolerant. You don't have to worry about it. Most Northern Europeans will produce lactase throughout their lives. It's an enzyme that's produced in the body. If you're of Asian descendancy or Southern Europe, it's probably likely that you might be, what, lactose intolerant. They'll lose the ability to produce lactase. And what does that relate to? Well, it relates to this molecule right here, lactose, which is milk sugar. It's a disaccharide. It has to be hydrolyzed right there to create two monosaccharides, which are galactose and glucose. Galactose is a diastereomer of glucose. The enzyme is specific for this. It has an active site. Here's the enzyme itself in green. And it's the uh, shape complementarity and the polarity complementarity between all the side chains on that protein uh, interacting, usually hydrogen bonding with sugars to get it in the right position there. And then it delivers water at that point and hydrolyzes that bond, okay? <laughs> so you've got this proximity idea. It organizes the transition state here, and it delivers the reagent, okay? And it does it at lower temperature. This is a very stable molecule. If you don't have this enzyme, this is going to persist through your GI tract down to your lower colon, and then the bacteria are going to have a field day with it. They're going to have a lot of other... Uh, carbohydrates to live off of, and that's where you get the gas, the bloating, and the, uh, the, the, uh, the discomfort wherever. So it's not a lethal condition, but it's certainly a, a comfort issue. You can't eat a lot of dairy if you're lactose intolerant there. So the catalyst, and yeah, we're talking about a lot of things here with physiology. And water. Don't worry about that. All, all you need to know for our class right now is right. This enzyme right here does a specific reaction, and it does it very efficiently okay, <laughs> by binding there. But, yeah, does anybody have any questions? Sure, go ahead. Oh. Yeah, Northern Europe. They, they persist in making lactase, the enzyme, throughout. 
Uh, it's a gene expression thing. So genes can be turned on or off. So some people, depending on your genetic setup there, uh, you can produce lactase, this enzyme, throughout your whole life and digest dairy just fine. But most people, once they're weaned, okay, after they <laughs> Uh, had the milk sugar for their mom, they don't need the lactase anymore. It goes away, which means if they eat a lot of dairy, this lactose will persist in the gut, and that can cause problems. Okay, let's relate it back here just real quick on the board uh, to this catalyst idea. So, yeah, we have that uh, first reaction we talked about. Maybe we can go back to that. It's just a simple thing with a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. I'll just simplify it like that. If you react those two things together on their own, you get no reaction. Okay? Not favored. Those two will just stir together forever and do nothing. But if you add sulfuric acid and heat this up, guess what? You get a great yield, and this ester will start coming over on your distillation column and collect all that you want. So what does this look like energy diagram-wise? Or is our first reaction, even though it might be favorable here to the products, okay, it's actually not, okay? There's some things we could do to adjust it, even if it's not favored there. But this barrier here, we'd say, what, is too high, right? But what does the sulfuric acid do? And once you add that, it does go at a, at a very good rate, actually. <laughs> and it's going to create a couple other intermediates here. So the catalyst provides not a change in the free energy, okay? The difference in energy between the starting material bonds and the product bonds, it creates a new path that's lower in energy, okay? And that's the key thing, and we'll see this over and over again. We'll see this type of reaction, this type of reaction. Hydrogenation, if we add hydrogen with an alkene, that's all we do, nothing, no reaction, okay? But if we add a palladium or a platinum catalyst, then we get a very good reaction for the alkane. Okay, it will go, provide that pathway. Okay, so that can be very important. Questions overall on this? Again, this is just introductory ideas on reactions, but you should understand the basics of thermodynamics and the basics of kinetics now. Okay, and then moving forward, we'll use these terms. The language of uh, OCHEM is couched in these central ideas that come out of general chemistry topics that way. So very good.